it's on the next exam, but also uh, it's the killer. So as we move into medical emergencies, I think this is why they move shock to here, because of the fact that uh, we, as we go through cardiogenic, anaphylactic, septic, spinal, we, we run into it. Uh, we did speak of this somewhat last year, so we'll continue. It's just inadequate perfusion. So adequate perfusion would be the, the, the body's ability to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cell. Inadequate perfusion would be the inability to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the cell. All right? The body is always attempting to restore homeostasis. And this is where the signs and symptoms of shock come in. All right? So this is, these are the terms that we use inadequate perfusion or hypoperfusion. I don't really use that. Don't really use this too much it, it, either. We just call it shock. If the patient's going into shock or shocky, they look, they look like they're, they may be going into shock. We always treat for shock. We're always aware of it, okay? So what happens is the inadequate amount of oxygen and nutrients are not delivered to the cells. Obviously, oxygen and nutrients for normal cell metabolism, right? Without oxygen nutrients, oxygen and, and glucose, it's the nutrients, we won't have normal cell metabolism, right? So we won't produce what? What we'll, don't we produce without these two? ATP, right. No ATP, no energy, no gas. Okay, the cells die off. And then with that, we can't remove waste product, so CO2 is not being removed. Okay, so we, we have a buildup in CO2. We look at this, we go from an anaerobic metabolism, or I'm not sorry, aerobic metabolism, which is with oxygen, to an anaerobic metabolism. Right? We still burn some, some stored glucose with anaerobic metabolism. Okay, the body will convert it, but we mainly burn uh, fatty acids, so we'll, we'll start burning a little fat there. All right? So, uh, and it's not the kind of fat that you want to burn not an anaerobic metabolism. Right? So uh, when it gets more critical, the sodium potassium pump fails, which we know uh, from the past, we have to have sodium potassium calcium for good heart function, sodium potassium pump for normal cell function. This is the way the cells contract to the sodium potassium pump. So, and then if we start losing cells, we're gonna lose organ, correct? So we'll have organ failure. Go. So, the treatment is to restoring this process, restoring the perfusion so we can get oxygen and nutrients to the cells, right? So, this is what we'll talk about the different kinds and, and what happens. If we, don't, uh, if, we're, if we don't have enough oxygen, we're not going to be breathing adequately, right? We're not going to get the proper diffusion and we won't be able to transport the oxygen. When, when we talk about transportation of the oxygen, remember how does oxygen transport to the cells? Blood. blood what in the blood? Hemoglobin. Red blood cell, hemoglobin, right? So oxygen is transported on the hemoglobin through the red, that's, uh, the hemoglobin is attached to the red blood cell. Different types of shock that doesn't take place necessarily, right? If, if a person has like uh, hypovolemic shock or hemorrhagic shock, they break it down into two things, they're bleeding out, right? So those transportation vehicles, those, that hemoglobin, those red blood cells are going out on the ground, so they're not delivering oxygen. That's pretty easy to understand, right? There's no way to get the oxygen to that because uh, they're being spilled out on the ground. So, Etiologies, that's just a weird word for how, how it happens, okay? So we have inadequate volume, which would be hypovolemic shock, hypo, low, right? Then volemic volume, so hypovolemic. And then they add in this hemorrhagic. Hem, hemorrhagic would be what? Hemorrhage. Oh, uh, brain. Hemorrhage. Bleeding, yeah, bleeding. Yeah, hemorrhage, just a big word for bleeding, right? So we have inadequate volume, 
on the sense that we we lose volume. Uh, hypovolemic, we can lose volume different ways. If nausea and vomiting, vomiting and diarrhea coming out both ways, uh, we lose a lot of volume, we become dehydrated. We still have to have that volume to maintain pressure. A lot of people who get uh, really sick, you know, like with the flu, uh, they get hypovolemic because they lose volume. So they have to be rehydrated. The other way is pump function, pump being the heart, right? So they go into cardiogenic shock, that would be that form of shock, where the pump is something's wrong with the pump. This could happen through like a massive heart attack, MMI. They could have enough, uh, you know, you have, let me draw. You have the pump, right? Sort of. And you have a large surface MI here. Let's say all this surface right here is now dead tissue because of the MI. And that much would cause cardiac arrest, but it would decrease. This, this dead part of this tissue is no longer pumping anymore. It's dead, it's dead tissue, it won't contract. So you have a, a oh, what is it called, a wall. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll come up with the word in a second. But this surface is not contracting, okay? So that's, you lose contractility because of that's not contracting. A large enough surface, it's, the pump is just going to wear out. It's not going to be able to contract, okay? The same way would happen uh, CHF, real severe CHF, as you go into cardiogenic uh, shock because the pump is not. Sort of like a car engine, you know? You take away, you have, well, you don't have eight cylinders anymore, but if you, you have a four cylinder car and you pull two of the plugs out, it's not gonna run very long, right? It's not gonna run very long at all on those two cylinders. And then the last one, sort of a dis, uh, different name for it, distributive shock that you might hear, or uh, vessel tone, you lose the, the vessels dilate, you lose uh, tone. So there's these different ways here. Here you just volume, so you have to replace the volume, okay? Pump failure, replace the pump, right? Or uh, life through pharmacology. Maybe that they will give, give this patient in hospital uh, medicine to increase contractility to try to keep that pump going a little bit longer sort of a band-aid on it. And this is vessel tone. You could also replace with fluid, but also the vagal pressures. You can cause the vessels to constrict. That's in the hospital. That's not what we would do pre-hospital. Okay. So either they lose, if decreased blood volume, decrease in preload, right? The preload is essentially the uh, an easy way to think about preload is venous return. It's the amount of blood that is in the right ventricle be before preload, right? Before it contracts. So uh, you, you don't have the volume there. That makes sense, right? There's no volume there, so you do decrease preload. And then if you decrease preload, you decrease cardiac output. And then the decrease in cardiac output causes a drop in, in the blood pressure. And this is what I have here. So blood pressure equals cardiac output times systemic vascular resistance. Okay, is that what, that's what that stands for, or peripheral vascular resistance, so the resistance of the vessel. So cardiac output multiplied by the resistance of the vessel. Don't worry, you won't have to do the math. Okay, you just sort of know what that is, okay. So peripheral resistance to arms and legs, right? So the uh, cardiac output times peripheral resistance gives you your blood pressure. Cardiac output, which is more significant for us, 46 liters per minute, cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate, right? So 70 milliliters is the average stroke volume. What's the definition for stroke volume? Uh, the amount of blood being pumped out by right ventricle. Really close. 
成一个，就是成一个什么？哈哈哈哈哈哈！不是这样。Hot, beautiful. May we not say that? Okay. Oh, you're right. Good job. Wait, what? She said it's the amount of blood ejected from each ventricle with contraction. Now, when we really look at stroke volume, we want to we focus on the left ventricle. So we can say the left, the left, the amount of blood ejected from the left ventricle with each contraction, the stroke, stroke volume, and the average stroke volume is 70 milliliters. Okay, and then of course you have the heart rate, 60 to 100 in adults. See, I knew you could remember that. Okay. Remember this formula. Okay, these different parts of the of that formula, it'll, it'll be important to you. So, we get inadequate volume from bleeding, diarrhea, vomiting, excessive urination. That's a lot of urination. But just, we haven't went over it this year, but where would you see this? Polyuria would be the medical term. Polyuria. Poly Many, are, are you asking like how, like how often would you find that in the patient? Well, what, what, what disease process do you find that in? Hmm? Polyuria. What? How about diabetes? Diabetes? Oh. DKA, right? Then you have some leaking in the capillary we'll get to, like in burn patients, okay? Uh, also leaking in the capillary in CHF, all right? So it requires an increase in blood volume. Remember, if the red blood cells are lost, we lose the capacity to carry oxygen. We can increase the volume, or they can increase the volume. I can increase the volume as a paramedic, or they can increase the volume in the hospital by IV fluids, right? Mm -hmm. They can pump IV fluids in there and increase the volume. They can't increase the, uh, but IV fluids don't carry red blood cells. They don't carry oxygen because they don't have any cells. They don't have hemoglobin or red blood cells in them. They're just mm -hmm. IV fluids. So they can't carry oxygen, so they can only do that temporary until the problem is fixed. Pump, like we talked about, you can't, the, the problem is the, the heart is not pumping the blood to the, to the tissues and the cells, right? So it's, they have plenty of blood, they have plenty of the ability to carry, their hemoglobin is great, but they don't, their pump won't carry it, so it can't pump it there. So there's a, there's a problem with the pump. Okay, like we talked about, a big MI, uh, CHF, a, a pneumo, pericardial tamponade. We'll get into all that a little bit later, right? Why would fluids worsen the condition? I mean, IV fluids. Why would IV fluids worsen the condition? in cardiogenic shock or pump, the function of the pump. Why would we want to get fluids in there? Don't overthink it. It's, it's, the answer is quite simple. Why, why would giving fluids worsen? Because that's not the body. You already have enough fluids. Close. That's right. The fluid is not the problem. It's the heart. It's the pump, right? So don't give them more fluids because they just can't, they won't be able to pump it. And all of a sudden now they're doing the, you're, if you give this patient fluids, you're forced them into heart failure. Pulmon, they're going to start getting pulmonary edema, right? Okay. So we don't want to give them fluids. Uh, 
here in, in the hospital, we give them vagal pressures. Vascular tone, here's this systemic vascular resistance or peripheral vascular resistance. Uh, we have a problem with vascular tone. They have a picture here, I'll just wait for that, but the vessel dilates, okay? So we'll talk about that in just a second. But as the vessel dilates, the pressure drops. So that's, that's the problem uh, dealing with uh, vessel tone. Oh, here it is. So we have a normal size vessel, right? And you've seen my picture before. It has to be better than this, right? Yes. Of course. So let me draw it again. <laughs> Much better, correct? Because there's a pressure on this wall, right? That this exerts. And what pressure is that called? This fluid, no matter how little or how much, this fluid is has a pressure. Can I borrow your water bottle? I'm not leaving you this one. If we had some sort of measurement here. This water is exerting pressure on the, on the sides of this water bottle, right? There's a pressure there. There's a pressure here. What, what pressure is that? overthink it blood pressure yeah it's just the pressure so this is a normal vessel this is a vessel that has been dilated for some reason right if there's no change in volume and the container dilates then what's going to happen to the pressure it's going to decrease correct so the decrease in pressure always that's one of those laws that always happens and we know through Darcy's law to our cardiac physiology that any change in resistance causes what to blood pressure? There's a, just, yeah, just like a still track. Right. Drastically, any change in resistance causes a drastic change in blood pressure. Where's the resistance? Where's the resistance in this vessel? Oh. Between this vessel and this vessel. Why is there a, a change in resistance there? Because one vessel is bigger than the other. Right, yeah. This vessel has more space for the fluid to flow through, so it's going to have less resistance than here. You're going to encounter more resistance on this vessel because the blood is going to hit the walls of the vessel more, right? And the cells are going to get in the way. This one's bigger. This is has less resistance, okay? It's like the same thing going out through this big door here. There's no problem, correct? Mm -hmm. okay. If I put this tank in front of the door and cause you to squeeze through here like this, it's more resistance. It's harder to go out because there's not as much room. But now there's no problem going out the door because there's plenty of room. So there's a, there's a decrease in resistance here, but with that decrease in resistance, drastically changes the pressure. Uh, so that's what happens in the vessel tone, okay? You get the dilation, the sympathetic nervous system functions and, and other chem chemicals that we'll talk about in a minute are released and you get a loss of sympathetic tone. Remember the sympathetic nervous system increases heart rate, causes vasoconstriction. Okay. So on top of this vessel here, if we had a, another picture, you can picture a nerve on top of this vessel, a sympathetic nerve, and it's controlling that vessel dilating and uh, constricting. Okay.
to re for treatment, uh, definitive treatment, we want to constrict that vessel down and restore the fluid. Uh, uh, definitive treatment, we really want to fix the problem. So anyhow, we'll, anyhow, we'll look at that in a minute, okay, on, on the treatment. So the, uh, really for vessel tone for distributive type shocks, you need ALS because of the fact that you need vasopressors or right, in fluid. And then just a little flow chart. I think this is in your book, so uh, it's just a little. See, here's cardiogenic, MI, CHF, beta blockers, which slows the beta response responses down in the heart, which is going to slow the heart rate down. Right? If we slow the heart rate down, it's going to decrease cardiac output, correct? Mm -hmm. Right. And then you have distributive shocks, the, the septic, neurogenic, anaphylactic, hypovolemic, which branches off hemorrhagic, and then non-hemorrhagic, like burn shock, I think they're calling it. Uh, questions so far? Everybody good? Uh, so let's look. Hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, loss of fluid some way, burns, dehydration, uh, hemorrhagic shock, loss of blood. So we have here, we have this hypovolemic shock or non-hemorrhagic hypovolemic. What this, what this picture is, is a sort of a vessel here where it's losing fluid, okay? So this would be a hemorrhagic shock. This, this is bleeding, and then this non-hemorrhagic shock would be this capillary that's, that's losing fluid. Uh, and that's leaking out. And we'll talk about this uh, when we get into the particular types of shock, okay? Here in just a minute. So this would be the loss of plasma in, uh, in, in water, and then this would be the shock of, uh, of blood in plasma. Did we put this in distributive type shocks, distributive shock? Or did we just break it down into the categories? What, like selective? Yeah, like neurogenic, anaphylactic, shock. Yeah, we broke it down like that. Yeah. The distributive shock, which here you look at, it's, there's three kinds. There's uh, anaphylactic, neurogenic, and, and septic. Uh, I like to just break it down into the categories instead of just terming it all as distributive shock, but all those, all those there lead to uh, the vasodilation, there's no fluid loss, there's no blood loss, it's just the, the, the massive vasodilation, and then we start losing fluid from the, the capillaries, the capillaries start to leak, start, starting to force fluid through those, those capillaries. Right. Cardiogenic, we talked about, loss of contractility, Right. Loss of uh, cardiac tissue, decrease in stroke volume and cardiac output. So here's the picture, uh, not as good as mine, obviously, but here's the picture where this had a pretty large surface MI right here, and so there's dead tissue, and that won't contract, right? So without that uh, tissue contracting, you're going to lose uh, stroke volume and cardiac output. Wall abnormality. Wall ab abnormality. That's it. That's the term. I have to guys say so. Wall abnormality is what this would call. So the the wall, the heart, is. Hey. What did you say? Shock. Oh, in airway. Anatomy. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Obstructive shock would be like a pulmonary embolism. I think we have a picture. Yeah. So obstructive shock, it's obstructing like this pulmonary embolism. All right. A PE, pulmonary embolism, 
have a high uh, mortality rate. Attention pneumothorax in like trauma or pericardial tamponade in trauma where the, the pericardial sac fills with blood and the heart's not able to contract correctly, okay? The tension pneumothorax with the shift, here you're seeing the, uh, the lung actually moving over into the mediastinum, all right, and affecting the, the movement, the normal movement of the heart, the normal contraction of the heart. And the pulmonary embolism will cause a VP mismatch. Remember, we talked about that some time ago. Ventilation to perfusion mismatch. Mm -hmm. So the amount of air coming in and the oxygen, the Q part of that would be perfusion. So you get air in, but you can't diffuse it. It won't diffuse. So there's a mismatch between the amount of air coming in and the amount of air that's actually diffusing. Will there be a VP mismatch with uh, the pneumothorax? Yes. Yeah, that's true. Because you're, you're not, you won't be able to get air. This lung's not inflating. All these are going to cause uh, MIs, definitely. The pneumo would cause the heart to work harder, may, may cause an MI. The tamponade just won't allow it to contract. It's filling with fluid and it's not, it, won't, it won't be able to contract. So they all affect the functionality of the heart. Huh? What about the Oh, yeah. We, what, what would you do with it? We haven't gotten it yet. <laughs> Later, another day. Okay. Respiratory shock. Uh, this, this, the dysfunction, sort of like the, uh, the PE would cause, right? Or diffusion of the blood. For some reason, the oxygen can't effectively. Uh, diffuse off the cell. Hemorrhagic or hypovolemic, when we get into trauma, this is going to be the most common uh, loss of fluid for some reason. So we want to treat this by replacing it with blood or replacing blood type components, red blood cells. Right? So we need to replace uh, the blood or the fluid. And then just loss of fluid, uh, diarrhea, that's a lot of sweating, but uh, vomiting, uh, excessive urination, I'll start by any, any way that you would lose fluid uh, could be this non-hemorrhagic hypovolemic shock. And this is true, people with the flu, uh, last time I had, the, when I had the flu, I was, I had hypovolemic shock. I was, my pressure was like 80 something. I was trying to convince them to give me fluids. No, no, it wasn't the flu. It was, uh, I had food poisoning. And uh, I got hypovolemic through, through the food poisoning. Trying to convince them to give me fluids. All right. Burn shock uh, takes place when, and, and this is sort of interesting. But uh, what happens here, the capillaries become damaged and they leak out. And so does the plasma proteins, which pulls more fluid out. It's the same sort of thing that takes place in septic shock that we'll speak of here in a minute, okay? So you lose fluid this, the same way. Uh, just these leaky proteins, these leaky plasma proteins, the plasma leaks out through the damaged capillaries. And then these plasma proteins, they leak out, but the pla plasma proteins actually pulls the fluid out of the cell with it. So the, the protein goes with it, that plasma protein goes with it, and then the, the fluid will follow. Sort of a hypertonic situation that it's pulling, pulling the fluid out of the cells. And then anaphylactic shock, is would like with the someone allergic to something, bees, peanuts, uh, you're allergic to bees? No, peanut butter. Oh, peanut butter, yeah. 
So if you go in anaphylactic shock, the same thing takes place with these different uh, distributed type of shocks. There's no loss in, in uh, fluid, only the loss in vessel tone. So uh, the, and you get the dilation. Once we do the pharmacology, uh, we'll learn about our medication epinephrine, which we, we touched on last year. Remember the EpiPen? You get the EpiPen, causes vasoconstriction, bronchodilation. Right? So uh, that's what you would give in uh, anaphylactic, an anaphylactic reaction or anaphylactic shock. Septic shock is when the, the sep sepsis or system so the whole body's sick. This is sort of, of that person with that big bacterial infection, all right, or that big virus. They're sick, and so their system is sick. So they have releasing uh, different toxins in their in their uh, blood. Let me look at my notes here. Oh, okay. Septic shock. They let, I call them the tines, K-I-N-E-S. They release these tines, so it's cytokines, chemokines. They have these uh, things that the adhesion molecules that hold the cell together. Adhesion, right, like tape, glue. And what happens is in sepsis or septic shock, uh, these uh, inflammatory mediators, okay, causes this vasodilation. You see why I had to write it down, right? So these inflammatory mediators are this, I L S twelve, I L dash six, and all and all. And they cause this response to these vessels, okay? And this is why it essentially causes the, the dilation. What the fix for this is, is to fix the septic, fix the bacterial infection. Now you don't need to know any of this. I put this up there just to let you know. Septic shock is, is, is uh, almost always fatal. Sepsis is a very, very high uh, mortality. Not mortality. Uh, morbidity rate, right? They, high fatality rate. Uh, so it's because of the release of this, it's, it gets more complicated than just putting the fluids back in or vasoconstricting because we have to fix the problem in order to, to get this inflammatory response stopped, okay? But that's outside of our scope of practice. So they do, uh, sepsis or someone in septic shock, they have to have ALS. Have y'all heard of sepsis, septic? People get septic, right? You should have heard of all that from last year. Right? Grace and Adam, TV, <laughs> yeah. TV, that are septic. But people who get septic are, they fall into the very, very sick category. So uh, they're, they're very fragile as far as their tour of life is concerned because they're on that bubble between life and death, okay? In, anyway, this is just different stuff. Yeah, I heard it ring as well. Nothing. This is just different things that uh, talk about septic shock that, that takes place. One thing you always note that the, the temperature 
But neurogenic, neurogenic shock would be the same process, ex, uh, vasodilation, but neurogenic shock would be caused by spinal cord injury, right? So what happens with neurogenic shock is they lose this systemic vascular resistance or they lose or decrease the sympathetic tone to the vessel. Uh, if proper sympathetic tone or the sympathetic response causes the vessel to constrict, okay, the loss of that would cause it to dilate, correct? If there's no sympathetic tone, then the vessels would, would dilate. Okay, so what happens to this is in neurogenic shock, there's damage to the, uh, to the sympathetic nerve fibers that come out below the injury, right? So let me, let me look at my uh, notes again. Yeah, so it takes place, so if you have a spinal, a high spinal cord injury, okay, up here, you lose sympathetic tone below the, below the injury. And what happened is, so the vessel now can't, it can't constrict because of the loss of sympathetic response. And then you have what's considered blood pooling so, thanks to Khan, I have his picture. So you have an artery uh, that dilates, and now there's just not enough pressure in here. Okay, so you have blood flow in here. There's not enough pressure due to the, the dilation to push that uh, blood through there. This is where you get into the MAP or the mean arterial pressure. Y'all sort of remember talking about that? Mm -hmm. The mean arterial pressure is the pressure that pushes blood through the vessel, okay? So you have this problem here, and as you get on the other side, in a vein, the D for the vein, right? Blood just sort of pools right here because there's not enough push for it. So it gets on the venous system and actually pool, pools, like it sort of stagnates in that vessel, all right? And this pooling of the blood will decrease venous return or decrease uh, cardiac output because of the, the decrease in venous return, the blood coming back to the heart. So you have two, you have two problems. Uh, two big problems. You have the loss of sympathetic tone, which causes the vessels to dilate, and then you have, in the, on the arterial side and on the venous side, uh, you have blood pooling, because there's just not enough push. There's not enough pressure to, to push that blood flow through. Shock is sort of like a tire. It has a nail in it, right? When you're trying to get to the uh, the tire shop is before you came to a flat. So you can, there's a few things you can do, right, to, to try to fix that, but you have to get there before the tire goes flat, before the pressure leaves the tire and, and the thing is flat. Once it's flat, then it's time to change it, right? You have to change the tire. You don't want to do that. You don't want to get your clothes dirty or sweat. So you're trying to get through there before the tire goes flat. It's leaking out uh, air. You just have to, to try to get there fast enough or do something temporary to keep it inflated until you get to the, to the tire shock. Cardiogenic shock would be like, you just got a big rod stuck through the side of your tire. There's no fixing that really too much. You need to replace the tire. Uh -huh. So uh, it's, it's not as easily fixed. We just, we've talked about that, cardiogenic shock. So, what's the normal responses? 
Okay, so to, to any of the shock, the normal body's response is to return it to homeostasis, right? So what's going to take place here is one thing that's going to take place in most of the shocks, except uh, neurogenic shock, is that the heart rate's going to go up. Right? Neurogenic shock, the heart rate actually goes down. Why does the heart rate go down in neurogenic shock? Hmm? The loss of the sympathetic response, right? A sympathetic response would cause it to go up, but in neurogenic shock, we've lost that because of the injury, so the sympathetic response is gone, so the heart rate will go down. So a key sign in neurogenic shock is a bradycardia instead of a tachycardia. The rest of these will produce a tachycardia because of the drop in pressure. You have a drop in the blood pressure, uh, the heart rate's going to go up. Or someone that is the body recognizes, hey, there's a there's a bleeding process here. This the, the body's bleeding. The heart rate's going to go up to compensate for the cardiac output. It's going to increase heart rate to compensate for the loss of cardiac output. Everybody good with that? So the normal response would be. Uh, would be uh, in, in any type except uh, neurogenic shock would be a, a sustained tachycardia. So the, one of the first signs that, in, that the person's in shock is the tachycardia. Sustained means that it's a constant tachycardia, right? You know, they, uh, if you get that fight or fight, flight or fight response, a sympathetic response, the heart rate's gonna shoot up but it's gonna come back down, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's not a sustained tachycardia. A sustained tachycardia is where the patient remains tachycardic. Always look for shock. Uh, even dehydration, you have a tachycardia. But we look at rate, right? We look at that rate, we look at the, the heart rate, and so one of the responses is a sustained tachycardia. A late response is a drop in blood pressure, a very late response. And this is, we just talked about this, because of the sympathetic stimulation, it's going to increase uh, heart rate, increase contraction, cause a little vasoconstriction, all right? Uh, stimulate the release of epinephrine from the adrenal glands. So we get that sympathetic response that we've been talking about. Other hormones, norepinephrine, causes the vasoconstriction, and then also, uh, you guys remember this abbreviation, the RAAS? I can't remember exactly, but I don't know. What, what organ? Just, I just, just start the kidneys. Yeah, kidneys, right. Mm -hmm. Renin, aldosterone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Renin. Now, renin, angiotensin, tensin, angiotensin, aldosterone system is what that means. Renin, angiotensin, tension, aldosterone system. Now you know why we call it the RAAS, right? But what you do, the, the body, the, the kidneys will release renin, okay? And through this process here, sort of a longer term effect, it's going to raise the blood pressure. The immediate uh, compensation for blood pressure is the, the increase in heart rate. Then if, if need be, the kidneys will kick in and also uh, help out with the rate. And then this just starts talking about the different responses, alpha response, beta, beta two, Remember we spoke of that beta one response, we have one heart. So the, the beta one deals with the heart, hence the heart rate. So if you have a beta one response, you have an increase in heart rate, all right? Beta two, two lungs. So beta two is a respiratory response. So we have bronchodilation, 
and alpha, you just there's not really nothing to remember the alpha response except it is because it's vasoconstriction. So you have epinephrine has all three of these properties in there. So it has alpha, beta 1, and beta 2. So epinephrine will cause vasoconstriction, okay, which will cause an increase in blood pressure. All right. It causes bronchodilation, and then it, uh, no, 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 alpha, alpha is the vasoconstriction, the beta 1 is the increase in heart rate, and beta 2 is the, the bronchodilation. So epinephrine has all three of these properties in there. Yeah, alpha, vasoconstriction, beta 1, increase in heart rate, beta 2, bronchodilation. So just do this, norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is more of a, uh, has more alpha properties, but it will increase the heart rate the same way. And then here's the RAAS system. The uh, angiotensin 1 starts out, then it uh, becomes angiotensin 2, I believe, in, in the pulmonary system, then the release of aldosterone. Uh, also, glucagon. Glucagon is stored by the liver. The GLU, right? Glu glucose, glue something, right? Mm -hmm. So we think of glucose when we look at that. So glucagon, glucagon is stored by the liver, and when the body needs it, the body will convert that to glucose for energy. Okay. But there's a limited amount there. It's not unlimited. A couple more minutes, we'll, we'll take a break. So, there's two stages. You have a compensated and decompensated shock. The way that you would know that there is a, that the body is compensating for the shock is that sustained tachycardia and the patient is normal tensive. So the blood pressure hasn't changed any yet. So the patient's uh, compensating when the heart rate is, they have a tachycardia and the blood pressure is normal. Okay. Decompensated, they could still have a tachycardia, but the blood pressure is decreasing. Okay. Question wise, when you see a, a shock type question on an exam, they will, you have to identify. You, you get the signs and symptoms, and you, you have to identify, are they compensating or are they decompensating? Decompensating the systolic blood pressure, so the decomp, the systolic blood pressure will usually be below 100. Right. So you, you have your scenario question, and you're reading along, and the patient's tachycardic, and uh, your blood pressure is like 80 over 60, right? They're in decompensating shock. That's the way that you're normally going to see the patient is in a test question is uh, decompensated. Otherwise, it'll be a tachycardic. It'll be tachycardic and have a normal blood pressure and compensated shock. Do you guys understand pulse pressures? Have we have we went over that yet? I'm not sure you did. A pulse pressure, a narrowing pulse pressure, is when the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure start to come together. They narrow. Oh. Your systolic pressure and your diastolic pressure are coming together. Okay. Uh, sign of a cardiac tamponade, as well. But uh, so. They're usually somewhat apart, right? But as you take your vital signs every five minutes for someone in shock, if they're unstable, correct? Mm -hmm. So you start noticing narrowing pulse pressures as well. They uh, they could be comp uh, in compensated shock. Yeah. Everybody good with that? Narrowing pulse pressures? Uh, so in any other situation, if the heart rate 
Because they have tachycardia, they usually their blood pressure will go up in, in a different situation because they're not stopped. Yeah. Okay. Blood pressure is going to go up because the cardiac output is increasing. The thing to remember here in decompensated shock as well is that we're in anaerobic metabolism and also our vital organs are not being perfused correctly. Uh, anything below the radial pulse, so you, you're checking the patient's radial pulse, they're, they're alive, they have a pulse, they're looking at you, but you check for radial pulse and it's absent. So the, the absence of a radial pulse sort of tells you, it's an estimate, but it sort of tells you that the blood pressure, the estimated uh, blood pressure of that patient's systolic pressure is below 80. So the absence of a radial pulse indicates a systolic blood pressure below 80. The importance of that is that a blood pressure below 80 also indicates that the kidneys are not working. It takes a pressure of about 80 to perfuse the kidneys or to get the kidneys to work. So that's a big deal. Uh, if they have, they don't have a radial pulse, but they have a carotid pulse, then their uh, pressure is estimated at 60. And then if they uh, have just a femoral pulse, their pressure is estimated at 70. Uh, so. Estimated pressure for radial pulse is 80, carotid pulse is 60, femoral pulse is 70. And then you have multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Wow, mods, what a big thing, okay? So this is when the organs start to fail. So if you, if you lose that pressure of 80, Okay, if the pressure drops below 80, your kidneys are going to start to fail, right? No urine output. If that keeps taking place without any correction there, then other organs are going to start to fail as well. So just multiple organs are starting to fail because of this, the shock, okay? And I always refer to this as irreversible shock they came up with a different name, but it's irreversible shock. What happens in irreversible shock, I don't know if you remember it back, but if you take that capillary bed, okay, and you sort of have, let me draw one maybe, you have a capillary bed here, you have all these capillaries running through here, right? So you have this capillary bed, on each end, of this capillary is a pre and post capillary sphincter. The, the sphincter is that little muscle that keeps us from urinating on ourselves, right? The urinary sphincter. So you have a pre and post capillary sphincter, those little muscles there. That's what regulates blood pressure uh, for the most part. Uh, these regulate and regulate blood flow through the capillary bed. In irreversible shock, those sphincters open up. They, don't, they won't close. So that's the time when the doctor's going to come in and say, hey, we can't control this person's blood pressure. Their blood pressure is continuing to drop, continuing to drop, no matter what we do. They, we can't maintain the blood pressure. Okay? They're like that tire again, all right? We can't maintain the pressure in it. It's time for another one. Okay, so here's the same same sort of deal is it's irreversible shock. You will know irreversible shock with the bradycardia and hypotension. So if the patient is has a pulse rate of 60, 50, right? And 60 over 40, then more than likely they're in irreversible shock. Right? And it's irreversible, right? No, no coming back from it. Same way with this, you get multiple organ failure. And this happens a lot. The patient will survive the initial insult, whatever that might be, and later uh, 
die in the ICU because of organ failure. That takes place quite a bit. So look for the signs and symptoms, okay? Always treat for shock, always think about it, okay? Especially in trauma. Do a good, good history. Note the signs and symptoms. So you need to know the signs and symptoms of, of each type of shock and, and how each type of shock develops, okay? Do a good chief complaint. Look for, you know, medications, beta blockers that could slow calcium channel blocks that could slow the heart rate down. Beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, they will slow the heart rate down. The beta blockers will block the uh, beta responses and the calcium channel blockers will block, block the calcium receptor sites, right? We remember from physiology the importance of calcium in, in muscle contraction of the heart, right? It, it expands the contraction out. So without the calcium there, we get we don't get that expanded contraction. So uh, do a good physical exam, good vital signs. Look for signs and symptoms. You know, pale skin, pale, cool skin, except in neurogenic shock. What happens in neurogenic shock is the patient will be bradycardic, very important. The patient will be bradycardic with warm skin, okay? The dilation of the vessels push the blood towards the skin and allow more uh, blood flow through the skin and less blood flow through the organs. That's, that's the major problem with that. Uh, so in neurogenic shock, warm skin, right? bradycardia. So pick out the signs and symptoms of, of the different different types of shock. Hy uh, hypovolemic or uh, volume loss is, is going to be uh, tachycardia, right? cold pain in the hand. That's the, because of loss of fluid. Our blood is what helps helps keeps us warm, circulating blood flow. And then you have these charts in your book. We won't take the time to go over them, but you have these different charts in your books. Very important. Uh, indicators of hypovolemic shock. So you look here at the vital signs and what's taking place. Pale, cool, clammy skin. Decreased urinary output. Make sure, as you're doing your study, that you study the charts. The charts are very important. Cardiogenic shock, again, pale cool, clammy skin, right? Failure, crackles, uh, pulmonary edema because of the failure. The pump is not pumping, so it's producing a, a left-sided failure, which is going to produce uh, pulmonary edema, the tachycardia, Nailing pulse pressures are there, okay? Same as the other ones. So you see the distributive shock down here, warm flush skin, right? Because of the abnormal vasodilation of, of the vessels. So very important as far as recognizing the different types of shock. Fever and sepsis, almost always. Obstructive shock, fat catnia, fast respiratory rate, nailing pulse pressures, like in a, in a uh, tamponade or something, JDD. So you get a good signs over here and vital signs. Very important to look over. Old people, young people can't compensate for shock very well, okay? Pediatrics, they compensate for a longer period of time, but they decompensate very quickly. So the, an adult can compensate 
and but they decompensate more at a slope all right and then they go into irreversible shock where the pediatric will compensate 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 and then just fall off the end these decompensate very quickly and then geriatric patients don't compensate well they're old I mean their organs are not a, a decreased function anyway right yeah. a lot of them so our goals airway management always adequate ventilation always make sure we oxygenate the patient okay if they're showing we oxygenate the patient only if they're showing signs of respiratory distress or their spo2 is below 94 percent okay and then uh if they're bleeding we stop that right uh, a cold patient a, a patient that is in shock uh, a, especially a hypo a hemorrhagic or hypovolemic patient you you get that patient cold and then their clotting factors won't work they can't clot as well as they used to you have to keep them warm yes north texas august cover the patient up use warming measures okay uh, on that patient that's in shock if you don't you're outside the standard of care you have to show warming measures in a patient that's in shock and then provide oxygen if it's indicated lamsipine we'll get into this this PASG is pneumatic anti-shock garment all right and that is according to a protocol in this region we don't carry them anymore I have a pair because I dug them out of the dumpster they sent them away they're like 300 400 bucks and uh, we just don't use them anymore but uh, in trauma when we get into trauma we'll we'll talk about that okay always consider ALS when someone's in shock they need they need ALS care you do a big part by uh, keeping them warm, keeping them supine, or oxygenating them. That's a big part of it. Uh, the next step is just to either replace the fluid temporarily, or right, with, with saline or blood, okay? And the next step is to fix the problem. Get them to the hospital, fix the problem. Identification in all these, like we're about to do all these medical emergencies, okay? Identification is a big part of it, huge part. Uh, don't ever get too complacent when, when you're talking about someone that's in shock. And we'll go, we'll, as we pick up like anaphylactic shock and spinal shock, we'll, we'll talk about that again briefly once we hit those emergencies, okay?